Are you ready to become awesomer? Hello, everyone. My name is Umar Hamid. I'm your host on the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their tips, strategy, and advice on how you can become better, stronger, faster. Just before we get started, I've got a question for you. Do you have a negative voice inside your head? We all do, right? I'm going to help you remove that voice in under 30 days guaranteed. Not only remove it, but transform it. So instead of the voice that sabotages you, there's one that propels you to much higher levels of performance and success. There's a link in the show notes. Click on it to find out more. All right, let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Limit Selling Podcast. And uh, one of the critical things to do in sales is very much if you don't get enough at bats being face to face nose to nose with a with a potential customer you are unemployed i heard that a long time ago and it just startled me what do you mean unemployed i'm working i'm busy doing stuff but the question is are you making money and the answer was no i'm starving so yeah if you don't get an appointment uh you're not a salesperson you're an order taker waiting for the phone to ring and today we have the privilege of having Brian Shirley with us today. He's a master at this, been in sales for a long time, and he's gonna show us today how to pick a dream client and how to land that meeting. Brian, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Umar, and congratulations on 300 podcasts. That's uh, quite a lot of casting, and I'm I'm honored to be here. Excellent, yeah, 300th episode. And when we first started, uh, we had about uh, a lot of success. We got up to about 89 episodes. And somebody hacked the podcast, deleted all the podcasts, hoarded the podcast for about uh, 60 days till the podcast provider finally kicked them out. And so we had to start from scratch. So uh, glad to be back. And so, Brian, why don't you give us uh, the 411 on uh, on who you are and what you do? Great. Um, so I was a straight commission manufacturer's representative salesperson for 20 years in the Maryland, Virginia, and Philadelphia, Baltimore, Maryland area. And <clears throat> I left that business in the early 2000s, I actually went into real estate development in the city of Philadelphia, mostly renovation work, but we did some uh, out of the ground work as well. And in 2006, I had one of those great offers to move to Southern California and become the CEO of a trade association of manufacturers reps. And so pretty much liquidated our inventory in 06 moved out to California. And I think everyone knows what happened in 07 and 08. And I'm not that smart, but I looked like a real estate genius for a moment. So I um, spent about five years in the association world. And then pretty much since then, I've been doing public speaking and consulting and coaching. Brilliant. So one of the things that's really challenging to do is to land those appointments because, you know, people are guarding their phones. you got voicemail, being uh, used to screen themselves. So if we were, let's say, uh, happen to be in uh, downtown Toronto right now, if I picked uh, 50 CEOs that I put on my wish list, what would be the strategy you would use to get a meeting with one of them in the next two weeks? Great question. And I think that uh, we in sales, we have to be persistent. We have to stay persistent but we must also be polite and be professional in your approach. So to me, it's a, a blend or a combination, again, persistently, but polite and professionally of uh, phone calls, voicemails, emails, <clears throat> direct mail, social media. And I think as everyone recognizes, probably the best method is referrals and referrals sometimes hard to find and hard to get, but there's lots of information out there that you can find out someone who knows someone and that kind of thing. And not, you know, I, I use LinkedIn a lot and sometimes I'll look at a third or a fourth connection kind of thing. I think sometimes that's valuable, but I think just, just sometimes sifting through some of the information you can find on the internet to, to find someone that could refer you into one of those 50 people. Absolutely. And I think uh, that's something we often overlook. And what's interesting is uh, we have this uh, hot wired need to be part of a tribe. And uh, when you find out that the CEO went to this school and your friend's son went to that school, like who cares? But if you mention that on the initial meeting, I noticed you went to Princeton. Uh, my uh, best friend's son went there. That's enough for them to actually warm up and let the guard down and start that conversation. So looking at the LinkedIn profile, what's happening on Facebook, 
you're going to find some common areas of interest. And all you need is one of those to warm up that call. Referral is the best way in. That's one point of we're part of the same tribe. But you can find another. It uh, deepens that connection and it removes the filters and it builds trust. Thoughts on that, Brian? Yeah, and I think that it it is to we're trying to create and sustain relationships. So just like you say, Umar, you need to in the beginning <clears throat> find a connection, find a commonality, but you have to make sure that you're sincere. You're not going to write on the back of your hand Princeton University, and then when you meet that person, look at your cheat sheet. You have to be authentic and sincere, <laughs> sincerely <laughs> interested in, in that person and the and the connection you're trying to establish. So I wouldn't just, uh, you know, I wouldn't list three things on the back of your hand that says chocolate labs because they have chocolate labs, Princeton University, and your daughter goes to the University of Richmond. I wouldn't list those things on your hand and hold them up in front of someone. Really, I think in sales and I think really good salespeople are want to create relationships. I always say, try to turn your prospects into friends. Absolutely. Essentially, yeah. Essentially, aren't your customers your friends? So what you're uh, trying to do in this create and sustain relationships is have authentic and empathetic relations that you create with prospects that then turns them into customers and then they automatically become friends. So I think it really goes to the point of uh, intent. So let's say I was, uh, you've heard of this phrase, commission breath. We have a salesperson that's really desperate and somebody comes in and they can tell that their intent is to sell them something, whether they need it or not, even though you're masking it with the right words. So when you come in and say, before I make this call, what I want to do is I want to add a value to Brian's world. And the end result I want is for us to be friends. And if a byproduct of that happens to be uh, that we do business, all the better. But if my intent is friendship and being of value, uh, you can sense it in that conversation, the way I, my tonality, my body language, the questions I ask and the information I provide uh, lends to building trust. And you kind of get a sense of, I want to talk to this guy a little bit longer. Absolutely. And it, it's really, you know, uh, a good friend of mine, Graham says, problem first, product last. Right. I, don't, I don't like too many of the phrases like what keeps you up at night and all that kind of thing. But it's really what you want to get to is, Umar, what's what's the most biggest challenge you have on your desk today? What's the biggest challenge you have um, in your business? What's the biggest challenge you have in your life today? And then again, back to the being sincere and authentic and empathetic when you're truly understanding what they're telling you, if they open up and tell you a problem and then go be the hero. Solve, solve that problem. Just make sure that, you know, you're solving the problem from their perspective of what their problem is. And you're going to be instantaneously a, a trusted advisor to them. Absolutely. I think when you're on a call, uh, whether it's in person or on the phone, if you can provide that, that person with an insight that they didn't have before, because oftentimes the problems are uh, uh, too close to us to see. And being that consultant from afar, if you can go in and say, well, you know, what this means is X. If you can provide that insight, that is uh, one of the planks to building trust. Because it's like, well, this guy is smart and I want to spend some more time with this person. Yeah. And, and again, following all the way through to solve that issue. And it might be something that you, as the salesperson, can't solve. When I tell you my problem, you might not be able to solve it. But we have a wonderful phrase here in Philadelphia. I know a guy. Yeah, I and know so if, if I can't help you and solve your problem, you, I, most of us are very well connected in the sales stream. And we know someone that can probably help them with their issue or their problem. So, again, make sure that you solve it. Don't just ask them what their biggest problem or challenge is. I know. Uh, I think uh, the guy that first said it was Southside Johnny, uh, but I could be mistaken there. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> I've got a friend in uh, his Fred Diamond. He runs the Institute for Excellence in Sales. And each time Southside Johnny, he's from Philly, comes to Washington, D.C., he's a groupie. I think uh, there's almost a restraining order, but uh, it's okay for now. <laughs> so, I saw Southside last year at a casino in Philadelphia. <laughs> nice. So one of the things is before you get on the call, you need to do some research. And uh, some salespeople, to avoid making the call, 
do a CIA level deep dive into the background of this person avoiding the call. So how long should you spend on your research and how many pieces of data should you be collecting before you get on the call? Great point because you, it doesn't take long, right? There's so much information out there that it's you sift through Google even, and then LinkedIn, then Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, wherever you can find them and just uh, get to know them. But right, you don't want to be stalking the person to the extent of finding all that information about it, but it certainly helps. I always say uh, three things in, in the great salespeople do. Be prepared. And that's that research piece, researching the company, researching the person, researching coworkers, and something that I think salespeople uh, don't do enough of, and especially in industrial sales, is researching the customer's customer. In other words, who does your customer sell to? And is, mm -hmm. are they in a good market? What's the trend for that market? But again, um, I think in 10 or 15 minutes, you, you find out all the research. But yeah, call reluctance. You got to pick the phone up, right? You got to do that. And again, in that persistent, polite and professional way. Absolutely. And uh, so what's a good way of uh, what are some of the best practices in using social media like LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, Twitter uh, when prospecting? Yeah, I, I, again, make it personable, uh, personable and personal that instead of, and I, I tell people this when I present, don't just click, I'd like to connect, I'd like to connect, I'd like to connect. That shows you went through a bunch of pages it's, that say people you might know and click the box, will you connect with me? Umar, it was nice to meet you in Las Vegas at the peak performance. I would like to connect with you. Make it personal. Uh, you know, everyone gets all of the like to connects, which we I, I mostly refuse them if I don't know who they are and they just say they want to connect. Um, so, again, make personalize everything. We live in a very personal world. Absolutely. Uh, so the opening uh, six seconds of the call are the most critical. because if you don't get that right, because the reaction of the person receiving the call is very much, oh, shit, it's a sales call. <laughs> Why do I pick this up? So what would you suggest in the first six seconds to uh, get them to go, okay, I want to give you some more time to figure out what you want? Yeah, be clear in your intent, as you say, and, and identify yourself, obviously, and then say the purpose of my call. I, like you, you've said this before, Laura, I want you know 15 seconds of your time now, and then I want 15 minutes of your time face-to-face. -face. And so it's being polite and saying, and here's why, and that is the value proposition or the value statement of what you tell them, why it's going to be important for them to speak with you for just 15 minutes of your time. So you work with a lot of manufacturers, rep organizations, and what that means in English for the people listening is you've got uh, a company that basically has relationships with uh, customers, and they go and figure out what the customers need and go get that line. So it could be uh, Sony and say, we'd like to represent you in this geographic area. We've got these accounts that we do business with. And Sony says, yeah, we'd love for you to do that. So you're working with those organizations, rep firms. So what does the first six seconds, 10 seconds sound like when you're calling people? So if I was someone running a manufacturer's uh, rep company, what would that, uh, why don't we just role play the first six seconds? I say yeah. hello. And what do you say, Brian? <laughs> uh, again, always identify me and my rep company. So my name's Brian. I'm calling from ABC rep company. We are the manufacturer's representatives for Sony. That probably rings some bells right there. You're identifying and providing why I'm calling you because I'd like to talk to you about uh, Sony components, Sony products, whatever they are. And so for you as uh, Brian calling to sales rep organizations, because you want to help them be better, stronger, faster, what does that call sound like? So if I run a rep firm, and you're a consultant coming in to say, I'm going to make you guys better. Uh, I say, hello. What do you say, Brian? I, I say several things about my consulting practice. I only want to work with you if I can move the needle. So I kind of, in the very beginning, almost promise or guarantee that I will increase sales. So if you follow my methodologies and if we talk, if it makes sense and if I can move the needle. I don't like to high pressure and say, I've done this, I've done that there, I've done all of that. I like to say what I can do for you is, and then talk a little bit about what I've done for other people. Certainly sell on successes. I say SOS is so critical, no matter what you're selling, testimonials and success stories, referrals from successful customers, 
things like that. Sell on success for sure. So Brian, what are the typical uh, objections salespeople would hear uh, when they're trying to set an appointment? So they get the first seconds, the person hears what they have to say, and then they say, what are the typical objections? Well, we I don't think any of us need more phone calls or more emails in our inbox, right? So we're kind of plagued with that. But I also would uh, hesitate to remind people that the old adage about it takes seven touches to get an appointment, I think that number is now double. And I think somewhere between seven and 14, 90% of salespeople give up. So back to my being persistent, you have to be persistent and consistent as you're continuing to follow up. These days, it, you know, depending upon your industry and what you sell, the easiest thing for people is they don't go to the office anymore. So that that's a, an objection to me. You need to be creative, do something different, unique and new and say, I'll meet you at Starbucks. I'll, how about if I buy you lunch? How about if I meet you wherever on a picnic table outside of your building, wherever it's convenient? I think we're back past the, the COVID point of being able to see and touch people. Um, but again, there are some just the logistical part of are you back in the office or if you're back in the office one day a week, getting in to see them there. But I think the customers, especially depend upon your industry, industrial sales calls after COVID, you know, the salespeople were turned upside down. Mm -hmm. If you think about we used to go meet with people all of the time, all the other functions in, in like a manufacturing facility, the purchasing people, yeah, they had to change things a little bit. Production people had to wear masks and gloves and things like that. But the function to me that was most turned on our head was the salespeople. We were used to going out every day and meeting with and talking to people. And we got that taken away from us. And good salespeople love to do that. So part of the getting back out there and getting in front of them, it, it's harder now because they kind of got used to not seeing you and they're okay with it. Or again, they're still working from home and doing this type of communication, which is face to face, but it's not quite like being in the room. So I'm going to give you some objections. You're calling me, uh, you're a sales rep. Let's say you are a consultant coming into a company and I say, hey, Brian, that sounds really good but uh, I don't have time for this right now. Why don't you contact me in, in the fall? I'll put it on my calendar to call you on September 3rd. Cool. <laughs> we don't have the budget. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about what your budget is and what it will allow and what new products or new ventures or new buildings or new houses you intend to purchase. You know, what, what is the budget? If you're willing to share with it, it's not in the budget. Are you willing to share what the budget is and has? Brian, tell me about a noteworthy call that you got, somebody selling you that uh, perhaps call you didn't want, but they were like so good at their craft that you basically uh, were happy to take that call. Do you have any particular memory of one of those uh, coming up? <laughs> I, I probably have a handful of those, <clears throat> which entailed... When I was uh, in in the in this our southern New Jersey office, and copier or, or printer people would come to to make a pitch, and at that time I had the lofty title of president, so I would, if I had time, I'd let them come in, and I mean that that was a daily occurrence almost if I was there, and I would love to see because they usually got some real professional training if they're coming in trying to sell me a. a Minolta Conoco or a Xerox printer or something like that. So their <clears throat> their training was pretty slick. But um, so I, I would invite that. And even on the phone, these days, not so much. We get so much spam on the phone. But mm -hmm. if someone has a good approach, a nice sounding voice, and they tell me their intent right in the beginning, I don't have to say, what's your call in reference to? Because that's normally I have my finger on this on the hang up button. So I think that uh, I, I've, I've had instances where people just, again, they're polite, they're professional, and they tell me what they're after. Brilliant. I've had a couple of times where I was uh, went to the gas station, and as I'm doing what I'm doing, there's a guy there selling a headlight cleaning solution. The guy says, hey, you got a second? Uh, I noticed your thing's a little uh, kind of frosty. Let me just take care of that for you. And they just put the application on. And as they're putting the application on, they made me hold the bottle. Could you hold it for a second? I'm not, I'm not holding their product as they're doing it. And then they clean one of the headlights. They say, how do you like that? Oh, that's amazing. 
then of course they're not doing the second one until you buy their product and you got that uh, beautiful before and after this thing that's cleaned and sparkling and this thing that's kind of faded. And so when I see people like that, I buy their product whether I, I need it or not. I had this one where it was a bunch of Israelis in Maryland and they're selling dead Dead Sea salt products for skincare, which, you know, I don't care about, but they were so persistent and handled the objection so well. It's like, how much is it? It's 40 bucks. I'm buying it just to reward you for being such a great salesperson because it takes an art, right? To be have that uh, skill, the uh, thick skin to take rejection and to keep on going. And that brings me to how do you develop that uh, ability to control your emotions because we live in this occupation where there is a ton of rejection, where people don't want to play or ignore you. How do you keep a positive attitude and keep going? Uh, I was on another uh, webinar recently, and the, the comments were all about the rejection of, of hearing no. And it was really amazing because I kind of chimed in and said some of the best salespeople have the strongest rejection strength. It's something that's measurable and it is very important. And it's not the let me beat you over the head 10 times with a stick until you say yes. But I always joke that a customer that says no just means they don't understand yet. Yeah. And I think if people say no, there's a couple things. So either they don't understand or we haven't shown them the value of our product or there isn't trust. And I think the fundamental thing we need to do is how do we build trust? Uh, quickly with folks because that trust allows us to ask more poignant questions and also their uh, uh, filters uh, dissolve and they answer those questions more truthfully because if clients tell us exactly what's going on, uh, my brother-in-law sells this to us and I'll never in a million years change. It's like, okay, thank you so much. Let's go. As opposed to they don't trust you. And it's like, well, let me think about it. Are we going to do this? And you think you've got a real viable opportunity or it could be, are you the decision maker? Absolutely. But if you have enough trust, it's like, well, actually the CFO and this person and that person have to sign off for I can do this. And that's all stuff you need to know. Otherwise you're going to think you've done a really good job of getting this deal and the last minute find out that no, I did not <clears throat> that, uh, uh, there's a whole new raft of characters that I never knew about. Trust and rapport, so important. And you have the capability in a first meeting, in a first contact to either build it or lose it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, let's remove this. Sorry about that. No problem. And I, I also uh, am strongly convinced, back to the product training of uh, whether it's printers or copiers or components or whatever it is, that we get so injected with product training that when we do get in front of a prospect, we just can't help ourselves. We want to tell them features, benefits, and advantages. And I think that's such a wrong approach. Back to the, tell me about you, ask, ask, ask. We have two ears, one mouth, all of those phrases that we've heard a million times. You go in, don't start with, let me tell you about this, what it does, what it, and it's really neat, and all that kind of stuff. Don't tell me about features, benefits, advantages. You did not not even ask me if I use or buy that product. So start with back to the, what's the issue? What's the problem? Or I always like to start with, you know, I'm not that familiar with your company. Can you tell me a little bit more about your company? And then we will go down to the most important thing. Tell me about what you do here. How long have you been here? What do you do? Personalize it. And again, it has to be authentic. You have to be sincerely interested. But to your point, at some point in the thing, you've been successful to get in and, and now you're sitting there you also have to qualify that account from a dollar amount, from your confidence of, of capturing that business, and then also from a timing standpoint. When you tell me it's not in the budget or come back in the fall, I understand the timing of it. But we as good salespeople have to have a keen sense of what the dollar value of this account will be in the future, what my confidence factor is that I can capture that business and what is the timing of the sequence of those purchase orders, whether they're buying a house or buying components or whatever it is. So Brian, what's a way that a sales rep can continue to improve their prospecting skills to land those appointments? Yeah, just uh, I'd say about broad and deep. 
if you're selling into a customer or an account, you want to meet other people. We're so guilty of all, all salespeople are very guilty of having one point of contact at a major account. You need to get broad and deep into the other departments, into the other functions. And simply by asking your main point of contact, look at that LinkedIn, look at whatever, and look at other people in that organization who are probably linked to the person that's your point of contact. And every time you go and say, I, in your mind, I'd like to meet one more person and maybe have that person or two people written down and ask your point of contact, would it be possible for you to introduce me to? So um, getting, you know, again, more reach, more people everywhere, anywhere. It's all, it's all about new potential customers, new people at existing accounts, new companies, new distributors, new listings, new buyers, whatever field you're in. It's all about new. New business opportunity is the lifeblood of salespeople. Absolutely. I think uh, we, need to, we can measure a million things in sales. And certainly how much we sell is like a really important number. But I think uh, how many first appointments we have a week meaning the first time we talk with someone new is one of those critical factors that can predict the future. Because if you've got more first conversations, you've got a stronger uh, funnel, stronger pipeline, and a freaking amazing year. Yeah. And in addition, you're right. There's lots of metrics in sales, more so than there was 20 years ago uh, with the sophisticated sales software and things like that. Many things to measure. That's most important. Sales Sales commission, great information and easy to measure. But then you get into metrics like you're talking about, as well as one that I've been measuring for years is amount of time face to face with the customer. And when, when COVID hit, that went to zero. But I, if you looked at what percent of your time, of your week, of your month, of your year, that you actually spend face to face, nose to nose with a potential or a customer, it's a big metric. It is a changing world. Like, uh... Our friend uh, Gerhardt runs uh, Selling Power Magazine. They do a lot of conferences. And he was mentioning that uh, the virtual conferences has changed the economic equation of doing conferences, that they're uh, a lot more useful for people attending them. They're more useful for sponsors. They're more useful for companies. That is a win all around. And now I think they're looking to do some hybrid uh, versions of those as well with live events that are streaming as well. But uh, what one would have predicted beforehand was that uh, no one wants to do a virtual conference. They want to be there and be face to face. And the reality is people want both. And for your and my world from the public speaking side, it's, it's so true. And uh, Gerhard's done a great job with the sales 3.0, which now is a on-site and virtual both. I think it's really difficult from a timing standpoint to expect someone from a virtual aspect to spend a day, like eight hours on, on a uh, webinar or, you know, on what we're doing here. But it, it, there, people have done very successfully to do bite sizes of that three hours, one day, three hours the next day and that kind of thing. So I, I, the other thing I see coming back in full force are conferences and also trade shows. I have a client in Southern California that has already this year attended two national trade shows and three regionals. So we're seeing more get back out there. Uh, sales is a contact sport. Yeah, right? absolutely. Get, get out there and touch people and, and you have to be in front of people. So what are some of the pitfalls that uh, salespeople uh, fall into that stop them from being highly effective in getting face-to-face -face appointments? Uh, I, I think back to the, you know, we are helping is the new selling, right? I think that there are some salespeople that are very assertive, if not aggressive, I call them. And I think at one point in my life, I was that person where I was chewing rusty nails and broken glass just to get to a new prospect. Mm. And I, I think that that was kind of a, a selfish or self-driven motivator when, again, it's back to what's in it for the customer. What is it, you know, helping is the new selling. How can I help them? What's the problem or issues you're facing instead of let me try to sell you my product lines. So, Brian, what is one piece of advice you would give sales people that would allow them to be more effective? Serve. Serve your customers, be customer centric, sales focused. So again, back to the, at some point you, the salesperson need to qualify the account and you're not going to say, I can't sell them anything. So I'm not going to help you. You help them as much as you can, but you need to have, I, I say it's kind of the best salespeople wake up and smell the money, wake up and know what direction. If you think about what we have as, as salespeople, time, 
is our currency. Time is the most important thing, especially if you're a straight commission salesperson. You get to wake up and decide, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to go do that, or I'm going to go something else. And hopefully that's going to generate the highest dollar and highest income for the company and for yourself. Brilliant. Brian, thank you so much for being on the show. How can people get a hold of you? We're going to put your links in the show notes so people can find you. But uh, what's the best way to connect? Um, Email is easiest and mine's pretty simple. It's brian at brianshirley.com. Brian's with a Y. So brian at brianshirley.com. Brilliant. Hold on for a second. Where is, uh, let's go at the stream. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming. And that is the fastest way to get better results. So, Brian, how was that? Awesome. That was fun, Mark. That was great. Good. It was a fast 30 minutes. Yeah. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, so what's happening on the, uh, so I saw the uh, documents mm-hmm. you sent me over. Yeah. So I sent you, one was the uh, transcribed uh, Otter AI mm-hmm. from your, your, your and that, that worked so well, Umar, I got to tell you. I, at first I had them both on the screen like this and I'm typing on this one. Yeah. I'm looking at our conversation and I said, wait a minute, why don't I just copy and paste it and oh, then yeah. clean it up over here. And so I took a paragraph, put it, moved it around. So it, it worked well. I did wake up yesterday. I told you, and I told June as well with that when we're up in the game room, when you do the, you, yeah, yeah. You're compelled. I woke up and I said, I'm compelled. So get out of bed and go, and go write a chapter today. And so next up is sales sophistication. Like we talked about as far as. Uh, nice. And all that. Yeah. So it felt, felt good. And again, it's, it's kind of choppy. June's a great um, editor and uh, nice. you know, more proofreader, grammatic and things like that. So I'm sure she'll be helping me with it too, but um, it felt, felt good to deliver something, as I said. Oh, brilliant. So what's the rest of the week looking like? Oh, hectic. Today I've got uh, five at 11 o'clock. I got one and then four Zooms back to back. Two two new clients, which is good. Um, That's in superb. The- in like buying and selling a rep company. Um, both of those calls are, are for that. And then the other ones are my typical Monday uh, existing client stuff. And that's about it. I mean, good. Uh, who else would be, uh, think of a, a few more people that'd be good guests, like on the sales side of things that are like experts at doing what they're doing. Um, for, to come on here with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, I know some, even some pretty successful people in real estate or, um, both would be good. Yeah. But, uh, uh, topic wise. So one, one side, so on uh, Tuesdays, I'm doing interviews with, uh, sales experts on, uh, presentations, uh, getting appointments, closing, just hardcore sales stuff. And on uh, Thursdays, I do real estate podcasts, which is very much realtors and focused in their world. Okay. So both sides would be good. Say hi to June and uh, talk to you next Monday. Thanks, Umar. Have a great week. Take care. Bye now.